my background, I think most people will be aware I was previously the chief executive of Scottish Athletics for about five years and, and before that I was I was five years as head of development Scottish Athletics as well so development's very much been a part of my role and, and, and my passion for since I've started working really my working life. Um, I've worked in various development roles, uh, started off at the University of Aberdeen as head of sports development and did a bit of lecturing in there as well. Then I joined the, the Scottish FA um, as, as a development manager there before I joined Scottish Athletics. But athletics has, has always been my passion and I've been involved in the sports since the age of eight up in Scotland and um, I was a, a member of a couple of clubs at Haddington and Dunbar before I joined Edinburgh AC where I spent the best part of a decade training and competing with them. And yeah, so it's, it's always been my hobby, always been a passion and I'm very fortunate that um, I now work in athletics. Uh, I have been working in athletics for, for the last 10 years or so. So, uh, no, it's great. And, and I think when the opportunity came along to, to, to become the, the development director of, of UK Athletics, I, it, it was too good an opportunity for me to, to turn down. I, I just feel that given the, the new approach to working, the new governance structures in place between UK and, and the home countries, um, the, the direction of travel, um, the fact that there hasn't really been any oversight around the development of, of athletics below performance and major events within UK for the best part of a decade or even more. Um, for, for me, it's an opportunity to connect back with the sport and really support uh, the sport moving forward. So really pleased to, to be in the role and, and really looking forward to, to carrying on. For, first and foremost, the sport is very much about you know, athletes and participants, isn't it? That, that's what the sport is. And within Athletics Unified, the, the kind of high level strategy that, that, that's been agreed between UK Athletics and the four home countries, it, it talks very much around the philosophy of, of athlete first. And that's absolutely correct. Um, athletes are the centre and, and, and the heart of the sport um, and participants within that as well. And but behind every behind the athletes or participants, there's the whole team, a group of people and, and for me, this sport is about people. And it's, yes, it's very much about the athletes, but it's also about the people in the sport as well. So, you know, coaches, officials, event organisers, club leaders, volunteers, support service. There's there's a whole raft of, of people that make sure this sport actually happens and, and put in hours and hours of their, their time, uh, mainly on a voluntary basis every week. So, yeah, for me, and this is where I guess I see my role and the role of development is about supporting people in the sport and, and it's making sure people do feel valued, they are communicated well enough and, and they feel supported in that. So yeah, so yes, athletes very much athlete first, but behind the athletes, there's a team of people um, that we must support and, and, and value and communicate with. So yeah, that, that's when I talk about people first, it's very much about the people that make athletics happen. So safe, safeguarding is one of several areas that, that, that fall within my remit, um, along with, with coaching, officiating, clean sport facilities and, and, and water working across the home countries. But, but safeguarding is obviously absolutely an essential function and support service for, for the sport. And yeah, there's been, been a lot of changes since the, the Quinlan Review came into to place last year and, and we've been working away with the home countries to ensure we're, we're implementing all those recommendations. Um, and, and we certainly should achieve that by by the middle of the summer. I guess key, key areas, um, you know, UK athletics are taking on the, the full responsibility for safeguarding um, cases within the UK. Um, and alongside safeguarding, we'll also be responsible for anything that, that is deemed to be sexual or physical abuse or um, that, that might sit out with your traditional kind of children under 18 or adults at risk. So anything that's sexual or physical in, in nature will also sit within that kind of safeguarding remit as well. Um, we have new personnel within within the safeguarding team. We've appointed the new safeguarding lead officer. Uh, we're actually interviewing uh, over the over the coming days for, for the two safeguarding officers who will be uh, the case management officers who will be uh, so important to making sure that any complaint that comes in is investigated uh, thoroughly and, 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 and fully and, and making sure that, that those making complaints feel supported and also those where complaints being made are, are, are given a, a, a fair uh, uh, support as well during that process. So it, it's absolutely a key function for the organisation and 
and we're working away and we, we should have the new policies um, for, for children and for adults, um, safeguarding policies, they should be um, complete. They're, in, they're almost complete just now in draft format and final draft. Um, they'll be going to the board next month along with the procedures that support that, the codes of conduct for the various roles within the sport and also the, the uh, safeguard and disciplinary procedures. Um, so they'll all be signed off in May uh, and communicated to the sport. The home countries are working away again. They, each of the home countries also had their own uh, recommendations to, to implement as well. So so they are working away and, and that can be as, as you're looking at the affiliation processes, uh, clubs signing up to, to the relevant policies and codes of conduct and, and policy and procedures. Um, it, it, we need to look at the education support for, for clubs and, and club leaders and making sure that they fully uh, appreciate their roles within the sport and also if there are any cases, how they how they manage those cases and how they are supported through that. So there's a whole education piece to, to start around the, the, the club environment and beyond that as well. Um, so yeah, so lots and lots of work going on. We, we take it absolutely seriously. It's fundamental to our sport. We need to get it right. Changes needed to be made, absolutely, um, and completely agree with that. Uh, but we're on track to, to make sure that we, we deliver against that. And then, you know, that's that's you know, delivering against the Quinlan recommendations is not the end of it. We need to make sure that we are ensuring that the, the sport is fit for purpose, whether that's the organisations as, as in UK and the four home countries and how how they're operating and how they're supporting the, the sport, but also ensuring that, that best practice is being delivered across the clubs and within coaching groups uh, and all the rest of it. So. It doesn't just end when we've implemented the recommendations from the Quinlan Review. This is very much about looking at what is best practice going forward and, and ensuring that our sport is, is respected and, is, and more importantly, is keeping people within the sport safe. So, yeah, lots of good progress. Yeah, just uh, probably worth just a little bit of background and, and, and the majority of coaches out there will be well aware of this, you know. UK Athletics, um, I, I guess the, the focus at UK Athletics in the past has been around major events, it's been around world-class programme and it's been around the licensing of coaches and licensing of officials and, and one or two other areas of course as well. Um, there hasn't been that strategic oversight around coaching, coaching development, um, there's not been a strategy uh, for coaching within the UK for, for well over a decade um, and it's absolutely important that we give the coaching community and, and clubs as well, the, the voice um, and and they've, they've uh, input into what coaching development looks like, how, what do they want, how do they want to be supported uh, going forward. So the creation of, of a coaching strategy is key. Um, we are, we will be coming out in the next uh, week or two with a, a coaching survey that just because we, we want to listen to coaches, we want to understand how they feel about coaching, what what do they want in terms of their support, their learning, and um, that will be followed up by a, a number of focus groups, which, which will help inform the strategy preparation. And, and there's been a lot of work done over the last year around the coaching strategy work. Certainly within that, there'll be uh, a review of the qualifications. We've already started that process, and ultimately we will replace the qualifications with a, a new learning and development framework that, that's very much role based. It's looking at a flexible, modularised approach to how we support uh, that learning environment for coaches. We want it to be as as much as we can work based in, in respect of you know the, the coaches' own environments and making sure that they are um, learning within those environments as much as possible, uh, as as well as coming in and, and being supported in other ways as well. So um, there's a huge piece of work to do around how we how we support coaches. The starting point has to be the coaching strategy and then following out that will be a number of, of programmes and projects. But we want to listen to coaches. We want to hear what they're saying. There has been a, a lot of work done already, but we, we want to make sure that every coach has an opportunity uh, to feed into that process. And then ultimately going forward, we want to make sure that we are we absolutely value coaches and their, and their roles. You know, <laughs> coaches are so crucial to the sport um, of athletics. We want to value them, communicate well with them. And, and make sure that they have the right learning opportunities and support opportunities going forward. So it, it's a massive piece of work, um, but we have obviously, we've, we've advertised for, for a head of coaching development role to lead that, that piece of work. Um, and we'll be looking to appoint hopefully in the next, uh, within the next month around that role as well. So no, um, coaches should certainly look out for, for the survey in, in, in the first instance, 
and then that will be followed up by focus groups. And I think we should be in a position by the end of the summer to launch the, the coaching strategy with a number of projects and programmes that, that fall out of that. The last uh, iteration of the, of the UK strategy for officials at that finished last year. So we've started uh, through the through the working group and, and obviously now within through, within Athletics Unified and, and, and the structures are now in place around that. We have the CEO forum. We also have a number of working groups. Coaching is one of them. Officials is another one. Um, so we have started work with the, the officials working group around the preparation of that strategy. A survey went out recently um, in the last week to, to all licensed officials um, and, and I should thank them uh, publicly because I think we've had more than 50% respond in the first four or five days um, to that survey, which is just remarkable. So clearly uh, our officials are, are very keen to have their, their views heard. And again, it, it's very important that we we understand the, the needs and requirements of our officials workforce. We we listen to them, uh, same as with coaches. We value them, we communicate well with them. So we, we really want our officials to input into that strategy work. Um, and again, once we've completed this, the, the, the survey, we will um, follow up with a number of focus groups and again we'll look by the end of the summer to certainly um, launch the, the official strategy work as well but yeah almost identical process uh, to the work that, that's required around around coaching yeah i mean tra track mark is i think was launched about a couple of years ago now isn't it and um it, it was very much about ensuring minimum standards of, of facilities across the country and, and when that when TrackMark was launched it was very much there was a, an awareness that a lot of the facilities the track and field facilities in the UK are 30 years plus old uh, and a number were requiring upgrades uh, and, and, and fell short of, of what we would term minim, minimum operating requirements so uh, TrackMark was, was really launched it to give track operators and owners uh, a focus, um, a guide in terms of you know minimum you know expectations for for facilities, how they better um, upgrade, how they better maintain facilities, uh, and what and how they work better, I guess, with with clubs and, and training groups, etc. So, um, yeah, and and again, there was there was a little bit of unrest at the time around Trackmark. You know, is it going to cost thousands and thousands of pounds? Well, I guess it depends on the state that facilities are in, but. Certainly, there's a lot of, of, of great stories that have, have appeared over the last, particularly the last 12 months, just around facilities that were in a, a real state of, of disrepair. And because of Trackmark and because of the professional surveys that have been done, that's given clubs and, and operators the opportunity to, to uh, approach the facility owners, providers, and, and make sure there's an investment to bring those facilities back up to scratch. So it, it's worked really, really well. Um, and I was probably one of the skeptics at the time, worried about the, the costs of that. And but there's been over eight million pounds invested in facilities in, in the UK in the last two years, which is just phenomenal. Um, and, and that figure will increase, no doubt, over the next two to three years as well. But to come to your point, yes, um, track mark, um, there's a direct correlation with track mark to um, competition compliance uh, and minimum requirements for, to, to gain a license. Originally, we'd set that date for, for this year. It was moved back a year or so ago just because of COVID had broken, um, I guess. And we've moved that back to, to the end of March 2023, so two years from now. And, and really, that's to just be, be fair to facility operators and give them a time where the priority just now has to be getting back to athletics, you know, getting back to training, getting back to competition. So to place this extra level of burden to say, well, unless you're your facility meets certain requirements, we won't provide a license for competition for your event. So we, we are given an extra you know, year or two now um, for facility providers to, to, to meet those minimum requirements. And I guess for competition providers out there, they, they do not have that concern now about whether um, they can get a license or whether the, the performances were count for power of 10 or whatever it may be. So um, yeah, ultimately, if, again, it's, it's going back to that people first. We, we need to think about the sport, we need to think about people and just be fair. So yeah, we've certainly moved that back two years, um, but it doesn't mean we're, we're, we're not continuing with the work where there's a lot of communication. Um, and Ed Hunt's come in um, back into UK uh, a day and a half a week to, to lead around the track map project and support the the, the Celtic Nations, he's obviously employed by, by England Athletics and we're very grateful for England for, for sharing Ed, I guess, uh, with us. Um, so, yeah, there's a huge focus on track marking and, and whilst we've moved that 
that time back a year, it doesn't mean the work has stopped. We will absolutely be concentrating on and ensuring that facility providers are supported. Clubs uh, and club development and schools, education, participation, these are all hugely important in terms of the, the infrastructure of the sport. And, and with, I guess within, again, sorry, within Athletics Unified, it talks about flourishing infrastructure um, and competition sits within that as well. And Katie Brazier has obviously been appointed in the last year as, as director for, for competition events as well. So working very closely with, with Katie around a lot of the competition frameworks and how we move forward there. But yeah, we have the working groups um, that fall out of the, the CEO forum. Um, I've mentioned the coaching working group, the official working group. Um, we also have one for, for general development. So um, I, I meet regularly with the, the respective uh, development leads from the, from the home countries to look at how we can better uh, work together to support the, the wider development of sports. So whether that's clubs, whether that's looking at how we support uh, our educate teachers, um, I would look at the wider participation elements or, or, or anything else that, that would be within that kind of that general development. And obviously there's a crossover into competition officials uh, and coaching as well uh, for that group. But uh, yeah, we meet regularly. So we are looking at um, how we can connect up and what, how we can look at best practice and, and you know, look at things, for example, a national club framework and what does that look like? So th there's lots of work going on um, that will come out and um, each of those working groups will have an action plan that will feed into the kind of reporting um, against Athletics Unified. There's a lot of work going on just now with, with UK Athletics around, around our plans at, at UK as well. Um, so again, a lot of these areas will, will, will feed into the various plans and, and, and the support will be consulted on those plans. Um, and then they'll be reported regularly. And, and I guess that comes back to the point on really good communication with the support and we need to you know we need to put people first we need to communicate well with people so um it's it's very important that the sport knows what we're doing collectively in terms of delivering against athletics unified so uh yeah that that will feed into the the kind of the, i guess the way the dashboard um and those reports will, will start to go out towards the end of the year once we've, we've gone through the previous consultation and planning phases so yeah you know clubs very much for me sit at the heart of our sport as well um, it's important that we, we continue to support and develop clubs, share good practice and, and look at consistency across how we support the sport across the, uh, the four home countries.